was the third day. A new day lie ahead. The sun was coming up, dawn was breaking, night was fading, life was coming back where once there had only been deadness. Yep, I was checking eHarmony. <laughs> if you weren't here last week, I need you to tune in and watch the intro to this series of messages, The Wedding. But I mentioned to you that in 2006, my wife was killed in a car accident. And it took me a long time, it felt like a long time, to get through that until one day a friend suggested, when I mentioned that um, I was interested in finding a new love for my life, a friend recommended eHarmony, and so I signed up. Hours it took to sign up for eHarmony. And little did I know that there are so many other people also signing up right here in San Antonio for eHarmony. And I checked and checked, but on the third day, I was eager to get to my office because it had become, by now, even though it was only three days old, it had become an office personnel ritual for all of the administrative staff to sit down with me at my computer and see who eHarmony had lined up for me as a match at that point. And there were, at that point, probably 30 or 40 different women to work through. And we began at the top and worked our way down. I mentioned last week there were certain conditions that I had. And, of course, when you sign up for eHarmony, you can put in even your faith preferences. And so I had ruled out certain groups and wanted an evangelical woman, at least, and, and much beyond that. And as I scrolled down through and we read the names and the information, an accountant came on the screen, and her name was Joy. And the staff literally jumped for Joy. That's the one. That's the one. And so did my heart. I felt that this indeed was the one. Little did I know, that was on my third day on eHarmony, that across town, 10 miles away from me is all, that there was a woman who was sitting down in her office and going through her eHarmony. She had only signed up the day before. And so this was her first time ever to open up eHarmony to see if she had any matches. And indeed, the number one person was me. So she was on my third day, I was on her first day, I was her first person listed, and she got the approval of my entire staff. And, and uh, life went on from there. Indeed, death had been replaced by life, and, and as I looked through the list and felt like this is one that I want to pursue, I had not yet chosen her, and today we look at step one, or event number one, in the ancient Jewish wedding practice of choosing your bride. The Jewish wedding tradition represents the relationship between Christ and the church. We can never forget that, okay? That is key to our understanding this entire series, that marriage in the Bible is a picture, it is a representation of the relationship between Jesus and his bride. The Bible refers to the church of Jesus Christ as the bride of Christ. And so there she was. That isn't the picture that she actually chose, okay, but um, that was our wedding picture as we got married a year later. Um, we, we met for the first time. We, we, we connected in the middle of June and met for the first time face-to-face -face on July 4th, and then we were married the following year on July 4th. That way I never had to remember to plan a party. <laughs> and there are always fireworks. And, and we got married in one of the top ten, 10 top most romantic places in all the world, listed Marriage Island right here in our very own San Antonio down on the Riverwalk. And I had a scooter back then, 
and I decorated it with a just married sign. And after we were married and after the reception, we rode through the streets of San Antonio to people's honks and whistles and cheers and waves. And it was a good time. But what I discovered was it took a while to get there. Because once a choice was made, there is the winning process, okay? You got to win the person over. And it has been said that the way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Yeah. But I discovered that the way to Joy's heart was through a dog. <laughs> and she had this husky named Callie. And Kelly had several interesting characteristics. Number one, she loved joy. Number two, she detested me. <laughs> In fact, she had a mistrust of all men. And I realized I got to win the dog. I got to be able to get through the door, you know. And so Joy lived in an apartment um, about 10 miles away from me. And when we would date, I knew that I would ring the doorbell and Callie was going to be there. Well, um, Callie was big, a husky, but Callie was also timid. And so she would have nothing to do with me. And, and if I tried to approach her, she would not let me approach her, but she would run off and hide. So I figured, I got to figure this out. Close to Joy's house was a store that I went in and bought all kinds of really good smelly doggy treats, liver and bacon and stuff, and filled my pockets with it. I'm sure Joy wondered what the cologne was, but Callie was impressed, at least enough to not run off. And I would pull a treat out of my pocket, and Callie would not take it, but I would finally have to throw it on the floor. She would grab it, run into the other room. Joy has a grand piano and would lay under the piano and enjoy its treat. Well, as time went on, the dog actually knew when I came over that I was friendly and had good things to share. And pretty soon I had won my way into Callie's heart. And I felt like at least that was a good first step. Choosing. Choosing. We're looking at the ancient Jewish wedding tradition. I'm taking you deep into ancient Jewish culture. And it developed over the years. We begin, and, and we'll be looking at Abraham today. We begin in Abraham's time, but Abraham is 2,000 years before Jesus. By the time Jesus came along, the tradition was still intact, and some things had been added on to it along the way or developed in a much better sense. But nothing, nothing, I don't think in all of Scripture, describes, or in all the world, the intimate relationship between Jesus and the church more closely or accurately than Jewish, the Jewish wedding ceremony. Your life, your marriage, your relationship is a type of Christ and his church. It's actually an anti-type of Christ and his church. It represents that love bond, that relationship. And each one of the 12 steps that we'll be going through, or 12 events, represents one aspect of the redemptive plan of God. The Bible is interesting. The more I study this, and I've studied this for decades, the more I study this, the more I see it all over in Scripture. We know Genesis, Adam and Eve, and Abraham, and Isaac, um, and Jacob. We know their stories. Um, but, but beyond Genesis, the book of Ruth, what a, what a wonderful story that is of a man and a woman. And the, the man is, is the line of Jesus. And so there's a double aspect to that in that he is going to give birth. His, his great, 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 great grandson is going to be Jesus Christ, the, the groom of the church of Jesus Christ. The Song of Solomon's, the book of Proverbs, especially the first nine chapters. The Psalms, one of the Psalms is even called the wedding psalm. The book of Hosea, all about a man loving a woman and the woman straying and being unfaithful to the man and the man hunting her down, finding her and winning her back. The story of God and his people. And the entire New Testament, we're going to see even communion 
even communion in the New Testament, speaks to us with marriage language. And throughout the New Testament, we have the marriage analogy, Jesus Christ and his people. And so the Jewish marriage consisted of two parts to it. The betrothal, which was an engagement time, it was a binding engagement, lasted a year, maybe up to two, generally more closer to a year about. And then there was the wedding ceremony that actually united the couple. Each step represents an aspect of that relationship between Christ and his church. Paul says in Ephesians 5.32, and we looked at this last week, in talking about wives submit to your husbands as unto the Lord, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And when we come to verse 32, Paul says, this is a profound mystery. It's a mystery. What is a profound mystery? The mystery of marriage is a profound mystery because hidden in it is the analogy, the picture, the representation of the relationship between Jesus and his bride, the church of Jesus Christ. Now, the betrothal period lasted for about nine, uh, excuse, excuse me, the first nine steps of the betrothal period lasted for about a year. That was the engagement time. It was a binding engagement and it could only be broken by a bill of divorcement. So it's different than our engagement period now. I guess our engagement period, all you have to do, ladies, is take off your ring and give it back, okay? That's a pretty good sign. But in Jesus' day and in, in before that, um, it, it um, was much more extensive than that, and it could only be broken by the woman and only with a bill of divorcement unless there was some extenuating circumstances. The wedding itself consists of the last three steps, that could last over a week, a week of celebration, a week of, 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 of joining together and feasting together and dancing together and celebrating the union of this couple. Today, I just want to look at the first event, the first step, which is choosing the bride. Would you stand together with me as we read our scripture? And I'm going to read a lengthy scripture this morning, and we're not going to get through all of this. We'll be back in this next week. But if you turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis 24, 1 to 26. It says, Abraham was now old and well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed him in every way. He said to the chief servant in his household, the one in charge of all that he had, put your hand under my thigh. I want you to swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I am living but will go to my country and my own relatives and get a wife for my son Isaac. The servant asked him, what if the woman is unwilling to come back with me to this land? Shall I then take your son back to the country you came from? Make sure that you do not take my son back there, Abraham said. The Lord, the God of heaven, who brought me out of my father's household and my native land and spoke to me and promised me on oath saying to your offspring I will give this land he will send his angel before you so that you can get a wife for my son from there if the woman is unwilling to come back with you then you will be released from this oath of mine but that in the Hebrew is written in such a way that that is not a possibility if the woman is unwilling to come back with you, then you will be released. Only do not take my son back there. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of his master Abraham and swore an oath to him concerning this matter. Then the servant took ten of his master's camels. We'll look at this next week. And left and taking with him all kinds of good things from his master. He set out for, Abra for, for Aram Naharam and made his way to the town of Nahor. He had the camels kneel down near the well outside the town. It was toward evening, the time the women go out to draw water. See that, babe? That's the time the women go out to draw the water. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> then he prayed, O Lord God of my master Abraham, give me success today and show kindness to my master Abraham. See, I am standing beside this spring, and the daughter of our townspeople are coming out to draw um, the, the water. May it be 
that when I say to a girl, please let down your jar that I may have a drink, that she says, drink, and I'll water your camels too. Let her be the one you have chosen for your servant Isaac. By this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. Before, wow, before he had even finished praying, Rebecca came out. And with her jar on her shoulder, she was daughter of Bethuel, son of Milcah, who was the wife of Abram's brother Nahar. The girl was very beautiful. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we look at this wonderful picture in the Bible of a man and a woman and the man's love, and the woman's reception of that love. May we never forget that this is a representation of your love for us. I am as a husband to love my wife as Christ loves. My wife is to surrender to me as I surrender to you, Lord Jesus. And in doing so, it's a profound mystery but it shows Jesus and his bride. May we realize that one day we will be physically, face to face, forever united for all eternity to enjoy your love, enjoy your embrace, enjoy your care, enjoy oneness with you. Bless this time in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, you may be seated. So I want you to see Three things quickly, and then I'm going to develop that third one a little bit further today. But I want you to remember that marriage is a representation. It's a picture. It's an analogy of Christ and his church. Paul said the marriage relationship of it, this is a profound mystery. But I'm talking about Christ and his church. We have to keep that in mind, and I'm going to remind you of it as I go along through all of the series. Marriage is a profound mystery. It is speaking of Christ and his church. Now, the Bible still gives us tidbits of information, loads of information on how to respond men to our wives, wives, how to respond to our husbands, how to love each other, how to be one together, one flesh. The Bible gives much information about that because marriage is real. But it also represents God's relationship to us, to his people. So the bride was usually chosen by the father of the bridegroom. Now, even if the father used a representative, the representative was speaking on behalf of the father, was acting on behalf of the father, was doing the work of the father, and it was the father who chose. It was always the father who chose. And so in the text we just read, Abraham says to his servant, go and get a wife for my son Isaac. So the servant goes as a representative. You know that the word apostle was used in the ancient Greek, in the ancient Roman Empire to represent, and in the Greek Roman Empire, before, I mean the Greek Empire before that, to represent an apostle, an apostolos was one who represented the emperor. So even an apostle of Jesus Christ is a representative of, as a pastor, as a Christian, we are representatives of our heavenly father. Jesus came as a representative of his heavenly father. He said, they that have seen me have seen the father. I don't have anything to say except the father tells me what to say. And, and, and so it was with the chief um, servant in Abraham's house that he would send his servant out with his voice with his authority to find a bride for his son. Now, the responsibility of finding a bride was often entrusted to the head servant, though. Fathers were busy. Abraham was uh, rich, and he owned m m much, uh, many flocks, huge flocks, and oversaw that business of his and other relationships as well. And so the Bible tells us that he took his most trusted person in all of the household. In the Bible, in my Bible... The, the, it says chief, chief servant, and the Hebrew word for chief is the person who is oldest. It can mean oldest, 
and it also means in charge. And so very well, he could have been both, okay? He was maybe the most senior of the servants, but the one who was in charge basically of Abraham of Abraham's possessions, all of his servants, all of his lands, all of his flocks, all of everything, the chief servant would have been like the chief operating officer uh, for Abraham and his businesses. And so the Bible tells us in Genesis 15, 2, then, if we go back there, that that man's name is Eliezer of Damascus. He was not of Abraham's lineage, not of his line, um, he was a Syrian, but he was the chief prince, the chief servant for Abraham. And, and so then we, when we put together Genesis 15, 2 and Genesis 24, 2, we have then Eliezer is the chief servant. Now, up above on the first point, the bride usually cho chosen by the father is the word Shaddach or Shaddach which is a Hebrew word, and you know the word, although you probably never heard the word. How many of you have seen the play or the movie Fiddler on the Roof? Okay, matchmaker, matchmaker. Well, that's the word shadach, right there. It's the matchmaker. And in fact, that is a reality. It's in the movie, it's in the, in the Broadway play, but it comes from ancient Jewish uh, tradition that often they would employ a matchmaker. And the matchmaker then would find a match and be the representative of the father in that case. So um, I want you to understand the will of the father. That's number one for us, the will of the father. And the will of the father was based on what God had said. The will of the ancient Hebrew father was based on God's word, and it was twofold. In finding, I remember one time, um, one of my boys was putting together a list of qualities he was looking for in a woman to be his potential wife. And he wrote it out on line paper, you know, like school paper, but he was an adult. And he wrote that all out, and it was three pages. <laughs> three pages of expectations. And he said, Dad, could you look at this uh, uh, for me and tell me what you think? And I looked at that, and I read through that list, and it was good stuff, godly stuff, and, you know, I, it, was, it was great. And so when I got done, I looked up at him, and he said, what do you think I should do with that? I said, burn it. <laughs> if you're looking for that person, you aren't going to find them. You're looking for perfection, okay? That is not going to happen. But the... But some women come real close. <laughs> Security, I might need your help here. <laughs> to f the, the, the father was looking for two things. Number one, to find a suitable wife for his son. You see, that's what God said to Adam. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable, suitable for him. And so we, we have the, um, the Hebrew word, azir kanego, azir kanego. We put it together and make it kind of into one word that is a suitable helper. Okay, well, what exactly is a suitable helper? Well, the word helper, azir, is the, is the word that means strong, Powerful, but it means a power equal to or a power corresponding to. And so it's not one to be more powerful than you. It's a complement with an E in there, complement, okay, to, to, to be a fit, um, to be similar to, to add to, okay, to complement this. Wow, that... That really complements your complexion, okay? Um, that, that kind of idea. A helper is one that fulfills, that finishes, that completes. A suitable, nego, knego, is the word parallel or opposite or complementary, like two hands. My two hands are different, but they are complementary. They fit together. They work together. Eye to eye. Kanego means eye to eye. Or one who is able to see 
behind. Now, Joy, I need your help. She didn't know I was going to do this. But she's been heckling from the front row. <laughs> so I'll just get you involved in this. Now, if, if we were dancing, <laughs> which is a little hard for me to do right now, <laughs> okay, I'm looking at you, and you're looking at me. We sang an interesting song. I'm holding on to you. I'm holding on to you in the middle of the storm. Will you hold on to me in the middle of the storm? Mm -hmm. I'll hold on to you in the middle of the storm. Tell me what you see. I, don't. <laughs> I can see behind you. What can you see back there? Right now there's space, but there could be people. And enemies. before that you saw? John. Doing what? Waving. Okay. <laughs> so you saw what I can't see. Correct. You can see my blind spot. That's what the word means, folks. Thank you. Give her a hand. <laughs> a helper suitable is one who has the ability to see what I can't see. To compliment me, folks. To see dangers that I might not see. To have a perspective that's different from my perspective. Not so that we can argue, so that I am able to evaluate and she is able to evaluate as we complement each other from a different perspective. That's the whole idea. And Abraham wanted to find a suitable wife for Isaac, a Azar Kanego. One strong enough to save or one strong enough to see your blind side. The second will of the father was one who would leave and cleave. And the Bible says when God chose Eve for Adam, that's why a man is united to his wife and they become one flesh. It actually says a man will leave his father and mother and be united together in the New Testament as it's being quoted, and they will become one flesh. United is the, is the Hebrew word vach. And it means welded. It means glued together, to stick like glue, to be welded, to be inseparably attached to each other. The idea is it cannot break. God made marriage to be unbreakable, okay? And, and why, why do we read in Malachi that God says, I hate divorce? Because, because marriage is a profound mystery, and the mystery represents Jesus Christ and his church. And one thing you and I can be assured of is that Jesus will never, never, never turn me away. Amen. If you have come to him, you are his. That's the reason for that. Now, man in his fallen state, there are things today that lead to divorce. We recognize that and the Bible recognized that. But it's not God's ideal because marriage is a profound mystery. So to stick like glue, to be welded and separately be attached, um, to become one flesh, the Bible says. To, to the, the, the Hebrew word means to be whole or to be one body. Now, I love this, but, but and, and I'm not, this, this isn't even in my notes, and I hope I have time to get this in, but I'm going to. When God, our Bible basically under the lead of the King James, says that God took one of Adam's ribs and made woman, but that's not what the Hebrew says. Every other place in the Bible that that word that's translated rib there is translated the side of, the half of, or the part of. Only one place is it translated rib. So basically, God took Adam, divided him in half, and made woman. You know what is exciting about that? You ready for this? It was the day God split the atom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he made man, and he made woman, and he made woman out of man so that when you put them back together, you have a whole. Now, those of you like me that have lost a spouse to death, Know that there's a hole. There's an emptiness when you've lost a spouse. It's a difficult time. It's a hard time. Because half of you is gone. I remember after Dorothy died, 
people would say to me, how you doing? And, and I, my answer was, I don't know. I don't know who I am. I got married very young. Essentially, I moved out of my mom's house, my dad and my mom, but I moved out from under my mom's care and got married and was joined together with my wife. And all of my life, I have either been with my mother or with my wife, and all of a sudden, at the age of 53, I was neither. Part of me was gone. And people would say to me, well, what are your hobbies? I don't know, because all of my hobbies took two people to do. And I don't like doing them alone. I know that many of you single people know this, but there's not a lot of fun in eating out all by yourself. Not a lot of fun in going for a walk all by yourself. That's why I really think in our fellowship groups that are coming up, we need to be very sensitive to those who don't have a spouse to be with them. We need to bring them into our fellowship, help them be whole. But, but we are made whole. The marriage relationship makes us whole. Now, do I need to remind you of this one more time? This is a mystery. It's a mystery. Jesus wants the church to complete him. The church needs Jesus to complete them. We are the body of Christ. That's what the Bible says, and that's marriage language. I'm talking about Christ in the church as a profound mystery. It's a picture of Christ in the church. Now, the second thing. The first thing was to understand the will of the Father. The second thing is to understand the work of the messenger. The chief or the oldest ser um, head servant in his household was the one that was in charge of everything Abraham had or anybody else. The process had not um, completely developed as it had by Jesus' day, the marriage process. That's 1,860 years um, later, Jesus comes along. Abraham was 1,860 years before Christ. Um, but there are key elements in this passage that are before us. I want you to understand them. Number one, the bride was chosen by the Father. Chosen by the Father. Number two, the bride was called by a trusted servant. Number three, the bride was for an unseen bridegroom can you see the spiritual application in all of this folks chosen by the father called by a trusted servant for an unseen bridegroom paul you never realize this but when you read ephesians chapter one in ephesians chapter one paul says we are chosen by the father purchased by the son sealed by the holy spirit it's marriage language marriage language right there and so, number three, we had the will of the Father, the, um, the, the, um, the work of the Holy Spirit, okay? And then I have the wonder of the Son here, the wonder of the Son. The job of the messenger was to extol the virtues of the Son and convey his thoughts to her. He isn't there. To convince her that the unseen groom was right for her. Now, before I get into the what kind of things do you say, I want you to get the analogy here. Do you remember at the end of the book of John, Jesus talking to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee, he said to them, blessed are you for you have seen more blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Folks, that's marriage talk. It's marriage talk. Jesus was inviting people to be his bride. Blessed are we. We have not seen the groom, not with our physical eyes. So the job of the messenger was to convince the bride that the groom was a good guy. So what did he say to her? Well, what would you say? He would say things like, you are his treasure. You are the focus of his love. See, Isaac is sitting back across the desert. Thousands of miles from here. I don't know how far that is across the Fertile Crescent. And he's dreaming of you. He's treasuring you. He's focusing all of his thoughts on you. He can't wait. He can't wait to see you. You are the poetry of his heart. Now, let's think about these three things. I want you to get the picture. 
the Father, God, sent his trusted servant, the Holy Spirit, to find a bride for his son, Jesus. Think about the love language of Jesus by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is Eliezer of Damascus. The Holy Spirit is the trusted servant that the Father has sent to find a bride and to call her to be long to the groom. So let's think about those three things. Number one, you are his treasure, folks. You're his treasure. I love Matthew 13, but a lot of people misunderstand Matthew 13. Let me just give you a key to understanding Matthew 13. The man, the man, the man, the man. In Matthew 13 is always Jesus. Always Jesus. Not sometimes, always Jesus. Now, one of the parables has a woman. That's not Jesus. The man is always Jesus. A sower went forth to sow. That is the man, and it's Jesus spreading his word. A man planted a field. That's Jesus spreading his word. A man found, a man discovered. A man cast his net, okay? It's always, always, always Jesus. And so in Matthew 13, 44, it says the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. The field is the earth, the world. When a man, Jesus, found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sold all he had and bought that field. Folks, Jesus came to this earth for you and for me, and he laid everything aside, and he went to the cross, and he gave everything. We'll look at the cost next week. But he gave everything to buy that treasure to be his very own. You are Christ's treasure. Never forget that. When you, when you are hating yourself, you're Christ's treasure. When you're angry at yourself, you're Christ's treasure. When you think you look ugly in the mirror, you are Christ's treasure. When you think that everything is falling apart and, and, um, and woe is me um, and I'm going to go eat worms, you are God's treasure. You are Jesus' treasure. He has discovered you. The Holy Spirit has discovered you. No one comes to the Father except he is drawn. The Holy Spirit brings you. For, verses 45 and 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. Jesus is the merchant. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. You are his pearl. I heard a phrase a long time ago. And I think it describes you. A diamond in a sea of pearls. That's the, way, that's the way Jesus sees us, folks. A diamond in the sea of pearls. We're a treasure. A treasure worth everything to him. Jesus laid all down. He who being equal with God considered it not a thing to be grasped but came to earth and laid down his life and shed his blood and went to the cross and bought us to be his very, very own. You're his treasure, you're his pearl. And the second thing, you're the focus of his love, Ephesians 3, 17 and 18. I pray that you may have the power to grasp how long and high and deep is the love of Jesus. You see, his love is so great for you, you can't even get it. I can't even get it. My wife and I had a tough couple of weeks here because I'm trying to recover from having my ankle replacement removed and my ankle fused together and she's sick and going to the doctor and we're just the sick caring for the sick. But you know what? We don't love each other any less in the bad times. Maybe even more so, our love for each other is demonstrated in the bad, hard times. You know what? We sang the song, thank you, Joe, great song. Holding on to you. I am holding on to you in the midst of the struggle, in the middle of the storm. You're his treasure. You're his pearl. You're the focus of his love. Romans 3, 38 and 39. I wish I could read that whole section for you. Neither death. How much does he love us, Paul says. He asked that question. How much, how great is his love? 
neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any powers nor the height or debt, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us, you, me, from the love that of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You are the focus of his love. Eliezer of Damascus was over in Mesopotamia talking to a potential bride. You're his treasure. Rebecca, you're his treasure. You're the focus of his love. From the time the issue came up and I was sent, he could speak of nothing but you, no one but you. The focus of his love. And the third thing, you're the poem. You're, you're the poem of his heart, folks. You're the poem of his heart. Ephesians 2.10. You know what? We, we, we know Ephesians 2.8.9 really well. For it is by grace, right, that you have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's the gift of God. By grace, through faith. But then it goes on after verses 8 and 9. It goes on to verse 10. It says that we are, we are, by grace we are saved through faith. To be, to be workmen for Jesus. But in the Greek, the word workmen is the word poema. Poema. Can you see it? Poem. You're his poem. You are Jesus' poem. Now, think about that. By grace, through faith, to be his poem. Doesn't love and poetry seem to go together? Yeah. How many of you have given poetry to your spouse? No, come on. How many of you give her a Valentine's card? Yeah. A birthday card. Yeah. Come on. Cards. They're poems. You know, um, you don't go and buy, pay $8 for a Hallmark card that says, Dear spouse, you're okay. <laughs> no, somebody has elaborately put together a little poem and you put it in there and, man, you give that to your wife and it touches her heart. Wives, you give that to your husband, you hope it touches his heart. <laughs> <laughs> the best part of the cards Joy gives me is what she writes in. But I know that she takes a lot of time to pick out a card. And she picks out a card that expresses her words to me, and they're expressed in poetry. Many of the old hymns are poems to God. I could give you countless illustrations. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Think about that. Put in your spouse's name. There's a name I love to hear. I love to hear joy. I love to sing its worth. Joy. It's like music in my ear. It's the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love joy. Oh, how I love joy. Wow. Love language. Love language. So you are his treasure. You are the focus of his love. You are the poem of his heart. Now, I want you to understand this as I wrap all this up. You, you, you. Yes. With all of your faults, all of your shortcomings, all of your past baggage and history, all of your failures, everything, good, bad, ugly, indifferent. The Father, God, sent his trusted servant, the Holy Spirit, to find you, you folks, you, for Jesus, you have been chosen. Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ, for he chose us before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. He chose you even before you made all those mistakes 
knowing good and well, because God has perfect foreknowledge. He chose you just like you are. He chose you. James 2, 5, God, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to become heirs of the kingdom he promised to love? Wow, wow. God has chosen those who the world looks at and says, ew. When I was on eHarmony, I would get matched with people. And then all of a sudden, I was disconnected. Apparently, I hadn't been chosen. Something wasn't quite right. Even Joy said, when she saw my picture, she was a little concerned because I, I, I was in my office at the time I was running a school and I had a picture of an eagle and leadership behind me and she thought that it just looked too authoritative. I had concerns about her because I had put in there my, my spiritual preferences and her, she was born in Utah. And I'm thinking, wait, could she be Mormon? That isn't going to work for me. Well, I finally got around asking her about it one day and, and before we ever met. And her father was in the military, and she was born in the military hospital there. What is it? Hill. Hill Air Force Base. Anybody ever been there? Yep, some of you have. God chose us. Knowing everything, everything, folks, everything about us. He chose us. Chose us. Those who the world looks at and says, I don't see it. God said, I see it. As Rebecca became an heir of all of Isaac's wealth, folks, you are an heir of the kingdom. Even though she had not seen him, even though we have not seen him like Rebecca of old, we haven't seen our bridegroom, whom Peter wrote, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. We haven't seen him, but we will. In fact, we're in the betrothal period. We'll see that as we go along here in this series, but we're waiting for his coming. But that isn't going to be for a little while yet. The father chose you for his son. He chose you. So I want you to rejoice and celebrate. You've been chosen by the Father, called by the Holy Spirit for an unseen groom, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me conclude. You look at yourself and you say, why did he choose me? I'm not worthy. First Corinthians, Paul writes, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Wow. I love this story. Some of you might remember it from years ago. In Gloucester, England, for seven years in a row, there was a swan that migrated in from Russia every winter. You see, it's a lot warmer in England than it is in Russia. The ice doesn't freeze like it does in Russia, and many swans make their way over there to winter. And each year, for seven years in a row, one swan could be identified and would arrive. They named him Crinkly. How do you know one swan from another? Well, Crinkly was easy to spot because he was deformed and he flew alone. All the other swans would come in in V-shaped flocks, not Crinkly. Every year, Crinkly would fly in solo. He had no friends. He had no mate. 
seven years in a row. He would land near Gloucester. He would spend the winter alone when the swans were flocked up, floating on the water, fishing. He was alone, floating on the water, fishing. Six years, six years in a row. And then when spring would break, he would fly back to Russia all alone and repeat the process year after year after year. But then something changed. It was the seventh year. Crinkly flew in on schedule. The people were waiting for him. They were waiting for his crooked, deformed neck to see Crinkly out on the pond. But the seventh year, something changed. Crinkly flew into Gloucester, England with a sweetheart. See, somewhere in Russia, something happened. There was a lady swan that looked at Crinkly with little swan hearts fluttering before her eyes. She looked at Crinkly, and Crinkly looked at her. And Crinkly said, I choose you. And she said, I accept. And together, that spring, they made their way from Russia to Gloucester, not in a V-shaped flock, but just the two of them. In the spring, when the weather warmed and the ice melted in Russia, Crinkly and his lady friend flew back to Russia. And the Brits couldn't wait for the following year when Crinkly and Mrs. Crinkly and family would fly back to England. When you look into the mirror of introspection, folks, and all you see is the ugliness of sin, the deformity of the fallen nature, and the imperfections of humanity. Never forget. Never forget. God looked down from on high. He sent his Holy Spirit to you, and he chose you to be the love of his son's life. You are chosen. You are treasured. You are his poem. Thank you.